I'm very happy to uh, introduce again uh, Ingrid Dubeschi. Uh, and tonight, I the title I have in my head and the title I read here is the same. It's surfing with wavelets. Except the talk might have changed a little bit. So. <laughs> but you will see. Okay, surfing with wavelets. Please. Please. <laughs> yes. So, um, I, uh, I'm going to start by, uh, I mean, you've heard about wavelets. I've mentioned wavelets as a tool that was used in the uh, art study and so on. So I'm going to give you a little uh, uh, succinct view of how wavelets work and why they work. So I'm going to illustrate it via image analysis. I mean, there are tons of formulas. I mean, I haven't given you a great many formulas in these talks. When I was at Bell Labs, I had a colleague who said, a picture is worth a thousand words. He says, but only if you have the thousand words. And I assure you, I do have the thousand words. I'm just not giving them all. Uh, OK, so as we saw earlier, uh, digital images are, uh, consist of pixels with their uh, gray values. And uh, typically, we have these 256 different gray values going from all black to all white. And here, I'm showing you uh, a, a high-resolution version, well, not so very high-resolution, actually, of a self-portrait by Van Gogh. And uh, there's a little bit blown up and then blown up again, blown up enough that you start seeing the individual pixels. And a tiny little bit of that, one row, I have printed the numbers below it I've to remind myself and you that the, uh, the smaller the number, the darker the color. I've printed the ones in uh, below 100 in bold and the other ones in lighter. And we're going to do some manipulations to those numbers that you should imagine yourself uh, uh, being done on the whole picture, but we'll only see it on a tiny little bit. So I'm going to take only this little bit. And one thing that's already apparent here is that most of those numbers are very similar to their neighbors. And that is very typical of uh, um, a high resolution image of a natural scene. If you were to take a snapshot of this scene here, then you would see that all the pixels that correspond to this are very close. Here, there is some change in shading, but that will mean that the numbers gradually change. But there, of course, are sudden transitions, like here. And so you have some transitions, but they're rare. And we're going to exploit that by saying that if we took these numbers in pairs, and for each pair computed its average, then that average would be very close to the original numbers. And I've done that here. And indeed, for most of those places, the number is very close to its two parents. They can do it again with pairs in this new row. And again, the numbers are very close. The, differ what, what, the difference, when I replace two numbers by their average, what I've lost is the difference between those two. So I can compute that difference as well. And most of these differences are very small. Occasionally, I have an, an exception. Or I can do it at the next layer. I could uh, replace, when I had these, these uh, black numbers here that were the average of these two, then I have that this, together with that difference, characterizes both numbers it came from. And so you see that I have, most of these numbers are very small, indicating that indeed its two parents were very close. Occasionally, I have a difference, and that indicates that something happened, such as this edge between dark and light caused these two differences to be large. Now, images, of course, are two-dimensional. So I'm not just going to do it on rows. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do this operation horizontally. So I'm going to replace the 256 numbers I might have horizontally by 128 averages and 128 differences. But then I've only exploited this feature of images horizontally. Then on each of these, I'm also going to do it vertically. 
So I'll end up with four arrays, one that comes from averaging and averaging in both directions, and that's this one. And it looks, I mean, it's only half the size because for every pair in this direction and in that direction, I compute one number. And I render them again in gray values that I had before, so that's why it looks like an image again. And then I have here something that comes from averaging vertically, but differencing horizontally. And now, because I've taken differences, my numbers can become negative. So the full array of numbers can go from negative 255 to 255. And if I want to render that in gray values, then middle gray will become zero, and I'll do the negative numbers with darker and the positive numbers with lighter colors. And what you see is that almost all of it is middle gray, except in some places where I have a vertical feature, you see. If I average vertically, but then take the difference of these two consecutive averages, then where there was a light column and a dark column, I'll get a big number. And so vertical features show up here. But that's just if I average vertically and then either average or horizon difference horizontally. I can also look at differencing vertically and then doing these two operations. And when you do that, you get these two arrays. And you see I have these three types of differences. This corresponds to horizontal features, horizontal sudden transitions, because when I difference vertically from black to white, and in the next column, black to white, I'll get large numbers, which when I take their average will still show me. Here I get diagonal features because things that give me big numbers there are like things that would be on a checkerboard in chess. I mean, black, 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 white, white, white. And then black, white gives you a large number. White, black gives you a large number with the opposite sign. And if I subtract them, that gives me a large number. So that's why I see diagonal features. Okay, but the thing here at the top is still an image. And I can do the same thing on that. I can, again, peel it into layers. Like I did for the one-dimensional array, I did it twice. So here again, I'll average and look at its three layers of different oriented differences. And that information, all these averages and differences, was enough to reconstitute what I had here. But once I've, I've replaced this, I have to add again the previous layer in order to get back to all the information I had at the start. And I can keep doing that. Again, my f operations and all the layers. And then again, and again. So, because at any stage in my operation, I replaced two numbers, A and B, by their average, A plus B over two, and also the difference, A minus B, I always can go back. I mean, you just have to take one and add half the other, and you get A, or subtract half the other, and you get B. So I have the same information, but you see how many zeros there are here. And that's why it will be, or close to zero, that's why this will be good for compression. We'll come back to it. Okay, now let's try to understand what this all means. So what I'm going to show you, I told you, I can always go back. Let's imagine that I do the operations to backtrack, but I forget about all the differences. I said, put them all to zero. If I done backtrack, what I get here is on the left. And now you see that I have cheated you a little bit, because if really I had averaged five times horizontally and five times vertically, then if I didn't add differences back in, the, the, the image on the left should consist of two to the fifth by two to the fifth block, 32 by 32 blocks of uniform gray. And it doesn't do that. That's because I have been a little bit gentler in my averaging. I actually have done an averaging with some tails. And I've done so also the complementary thing in my differencing, so that I have a higher order scheme. But so I still have a scheme that has the low resolution of uh, something that would correspond to 32 by 32 blocks, but it's a bit smoother. And let's now add in layer after layer of differences. And you see how the image at the left gets built up. So let's see, look at that again, but let's look at it in two different places on the image. Let's look, concentrate on a piece in the sky and a piece in the sail. And I've copied these both here. And what we're going to do 
is we're going to, we're going to do this several times, so we'll revisit this. But uh, what I'm going to do is I'm now going to show you on the sail and on the sky this adding of differences. Okay, concentrate on the patch of sail. So here we have the sail, and I'm going to add detail. And you see, as I keep adding detail, I need, I need to add more and more because, I mean, before I get a sharp image. Let's do it on the sky. So look at the sky now. Now here, this has a bit more texture than this piece of sky. This is very, very smooth. And I'll, I'll add in, and if I toggle back and forth, you'll see a little bit of difference. I hope you see a little bit of difference. But from now on, nothing much happens in this sky. So in the sky, I didn't need to find detail. And that comes from the fact that if I look at my image, there was nothing there in the sky. There were no fine details. Uh, something that I'd like to draw your attention to as well is that at fine scales, I have many, many, many numbers. Many of them are zero, but I have the potential, a potential crowd of many uh, uh, little, little pigeonholes that I could populate with numbers. As I go to coarser and coarser scales, I, have fewer, I need fewer and fewer. And that's because the building blocks are wider and wider. I mean, I have tiny details and then coarser details and even coarser details and so on. Another way in which you can imagine it, and that's what we saw when we built up the image, is you start with a very, very average, very blurry version of your image, and then you need to add in some detail, and then you zoom in a bit more, and you add finer and finer detail, and so on. It's as you, if you imagine making a, a, a drawing by first using broad wash, washes, and then after that has dried, using finer, brushes and then so on. In the very end, using an Indian ink thing to, to put in, in pen to, to put in little details. Okay, compression. Well, if I take only the, the things that I color red here on the left, then what I get is the image on the right. It's not perfect. And in fact, if we go back and just look at the image, I toggle back and forth, you see it's not perfect. But it's pretty darn good. I mean, especially if you think of how many bits we retained. We have about 1 30th of the original uh, uh, memory space. Now, this was an 8-bit image, so every 2x2 two two block would have used about 32 bits. Not about, 32 bits. Um, so I have, for every 2x2 two two block, I now have retained about 1 bit. That would be enough for every 2x2 two two block to tell you, if I were not being smart about it, whether it was on the white side or on the black side. Yet, I get a, an image that is much better than the quality I would obtain if I did that. Because we have done something that's much more adaptive to what images do. If I use all the green uh, uh, pixels here as well, on the right, then I get a perfect image. It turns out it's not so hard to get a perfect reconstruction with about one bit in eight, uh, with about 10% of the bits. But to have something that then gracefully uh, uh, degrades as you half and half again the number of bits, that is harder. And that's the reason why wavelets uh, were adopted in the JPEG 2000 standards. Now, I'm often asked, does that mean that my, uh, uh, my, my snap and shoot camera uh, is, uses, uses this, this algorithm? And the answer is no. If you have JPEG images, they use an older standard which is based on the discrete cosine transform. The JPEG 1000 uh, standard, which is used on certain internet applications, is also used for digital cinema. In, if you go to a digital movie theater in Europe or in the States, every still has been compressed. I mean, as they download it, they used to have these very big spool tables on which they would have these, these movie rolls and so on. Now it's done, they download it digitally in, 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 in memories and then project. So that has been compressed with JPEG 2000. Um, sports transmissions on ESPN and also in Europe are transmitted with uh, uh, JPEG 2000. And actually, I didn't know that. I knew it for movies, but I didn't know it for sports 
until uh, a few years ago, I was going to go away for quite a period. And so in order to, to comfort my husband, I had bought him, before they became cheaper, one of these big screen televisions so he could watch his sports uh, with chums and not feel lonely. And, uh, uh, and so before I left, we were watching, I mean, my husband was watching a, a Premier League uh, soccer game and, and a football game. And uh, I, uh, I said, oh, wow, I said, they use wavelets. He says, yes, yes, uh, watching intently. Uh, how can you tell? I said, look, I mean, here are the artifacts in the grass. He says, who cares about the grass? <laughs> I mean, and that's exactly why. I mean, uh, all the players were sharp. I mean, which is what people watched. And in the grass, where it didn't matter, I mean, they could compress to heart's content. Um, OK, another aspect that wavelets have is that they have this very nice localization. Imagine that, uh, so, this is just a mock-up of what could be an application where you have very high resolution images stored remotely and you have to pull up details of those images, but you know you don't want the full image uh, uh, over a bad channel. So you could imagine some, a medical thing where you want to look up x-rays, but you want to zoom only at a certain region and you want to use that information in order to get, retrieve things faster. So here, imagine I have the image on the left and I know that I will want only this region here, in this particular case, because it's the number of the sailboat, but it could be a particular side of the stomach in an x-ray or something. Then I can send that information, I can mark a box here, and that information goes back. That's very brief information, it's easy to send back. The database then knows exactly which of the pixels it, I will want, and it will send me only those. And if I reconstruct, I get that zone very sharply. And that's something that JPEG 2000 can do and JPEG cannot, because we can zoom in like that, this localization. So where's the math in all this? Well, we have decomposed the image, or a signal, or a function, or an operator. You can, there are many things you can decompose into building blocks that are localized. I've shown you that that you localize as you become one more, that are adapted to the different scale. The fine scale things were very localized, the core scale things were wide. And you use, and that's the important thing, the fine scale building blocks only where you need them, where there is detail to reconstruct. Where there's no detail, you don't bother. And so you first send information about, for this image, I'll need stuff there and there and there, and then you send the, the, the coefficients. Now, of course, in practice, I mean, this, what I just told you, is the mathematician's caricature. I mean, in practice, engineers uh, uh, do smart things to use the bid budget that they have in, in a very effective way. And, uh, but morally speaking, what I said is okay. Okay, now I have a confession to make. Because Margaret Berger was, 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 was not quite, uh, was, was, on the mark when he said that I, the talk might be slightly different. This afternoon, as I was preparing my talk, I was so convinced I was going to tell you about another big project on which I've been working these last few years, which I already announced to you on Tuesday night, namely on adaptive uh, time frequency analysis, that when I got to the last slide making the title page for today, and I saw that I had promised surfing on waves, oh my God, I mean, uh, so, I decided that I would, for all those of you who wanted to hear about surfing on wavelets, I would tell you a little bit about that. But then you've seen some of the applications already. You've seen how we used wavelets for uh, uh, the art application, how we use them to, to, I mean, you have seen now how we look at details and so on, and how we can then use them to, to bring stuff back, I mean, to, to build up things. That's exactly what we use when we do the in-painting, for instance. So I'm going to let you imagine that, or you can find things on the internet. And I'm going to now shift to the adaptive time frequency analysis that I promised you on, on Tuesday night. So in which wavelets will play a role too. Okay, so this is actually uh, something, uh, again, I've been working on for the last five years or so. Uh, we when we analyze signals, so we want to detect anomalies and so on, we know that we like to decompose functions into wavelets or cosine or, or Fourier series or so on. But very often, that's not sufficient. Because very often, 
the thing, I mean, and this happens in a lot of biomedical signal processing, things might look very nice like this. This looks like a, a well, like a, a cosine, except the amplitude's not quite constant, except it starts, it breathes a little bit. It oscillates a bit faster sometimes and it's slower other times. If you decompose this in Fourier waves, you get zillions of modes. And, I mean, you can try it, and it's very uninformative. You can, even the, the shape can be something that looks a little bit different. Here I only have the amplitude changing, no longer the, the, the frequency. No, the frequency is changing too, actually. So, uh, when you get something like that, you'd like to write it as something that, I mean, the first one, it's a cosine of some function, except that function is not linear in t. It speeds up and it slows me. The derivative is not constant. The amplitude is not constant. Now, what I, I'm, I'm, I have to put on some, I mean, what I'm going to say here is, I always want phi so that their derivative is positive. So that is like the, instant, the frequency. And I always want the changes in A and in phi prime to be very small compared to phi prime itself. So that it really is like the kind of thing I was seeing here or here. But I want to extract those things. And, well, when I have a shape function, I might want some other two-power periodic function. You might say, wow, surely that's very easy. Well, it's not. This, this is an example of a situation where we want something like that. This is an electrocardiogram. And here all the, what are called the R peaks have been marked. So they're the, the big peaks in the electrocardiogram. Now, you've all seen electrocardiograms whether it's in, 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 in movies or in a hospital visiting somebody, the shape clearly looks kind of the same. Kind of, not exactly. The amplitudes are different. The frequencies are different. In fact, the, uh, the changes in frequency in a heartbeat, in an ECG, indicate your respiratory cycle. Your heartbeat is a little faster, a little slower, depending on whether you're breathing in or breathing out. And this is a way in which, in uh, situations where it's not convenient to measure your breathing, people can monitor, your, uh, doctors can monitor your, your respir respiration. So, in fact, I'm not going to talk much more about it, but I have, this is joint work with a former student of mine, Hao Tiang Wu, who is uh, not only has a PhD in applied mathematics and has done wonderful stuff, but also, prior to coming, back to, to coming to back to school, was a fully trained radiologist. And it's because he saw uh, ways of analyzing signals in his, in his research lab that he wanted to understand much better that he went back to school. Uh, so together, uh, uh, work with, uh, together with Hao Tiang Wu on getting out this frequency oscillations in the heartbeat is now being used in clinical trials in Taiwan for ventilator weaning. When people have a respiratory arrest, uh, they, they, uh, they get intubated. And you've probably seen this on movie. Doctors react extremely quickly and they actually make a hole in your trachea and so that they can, with a ventilator, have you, your body breathe. When your respiration system kicks back in again, they'd like to know because they want to re remove the intubation because, in fact, it leads to complications when you have, on the one hand, this external um, mechanism that tries to make you breathe at a certain rhythm. On the other hand, your own breathing system that, likes to, that wants to breathe at its rhythm. So, on the other hand, if they, in, they, if they uh, detubate too early, then it causes problems too. Well, you stop breathing. So, um, this ventilator weaning is something that they really would like to assess well. And what happens, as so many cases in medicine, is that there are people who become very good at seeing this, and other, most people not so good. And so they'd like to be able to do this automatically. And uh, the, with, with, what, with our method of extracting this instantaneous frequency changes in the heartbeat, which is monitored anyway on these patients, uh, it can be assessed in a couple of minutes which is much faster than the previously clinically approved method, which took half an hour. Of course, a real expert can do it in less than the, the, the two or three minutes. 
but you'd like it to be possible for not, I mean, usually hospitals don't have very many of these super experts at this. Okay, so in general, we want to take functions that are combinations of a small number of such oscillations, noisy, of course. Uh, an example where you might have a combination of two of them is, for instance, monitoring fetal heartbeat. I mean, there you have the heartbeat of the mother, which is the dominant signal, but you also have the heartbeat of the fetus. You have two of them. They have different shapes, different frequencies, different amplitudes, and you want to distinguish them. Okay, so for all these applications, it's important to follow what the amplitudes are, to follow these instantaneous frequencies, and to find the shape functions. So how do you do that? Okay, now... I have to warn you, to begin with, this is not a well-defined problem, as you might imagine from the start. I mean, even one signal, if it's oscillatory, I can write in many different ways. So what we're trying to do is to do it especially meaningfully. And I mean, this signal, for instance, you can view it as a cosine signal that has been modulated with an amplitude, or you can actually write this as the sum of three cosines with neighboring frequencies and constant amplitudes. You need three, not two, because I don't want, if I had two and I have beatings, then I have little funny things in the amplitude, the amplitude would have to change sign in order to follow this. But with three, you can make this. And typically what we, so, so we are not going to write something that is going to be true for everything in L2, or for all possible signals. What we say is we're looking at signals where we know that they have this shape with a few Number, uh, a few of these terms, we want to find them. And we can formulate, we can make this exact. Okay, so what motivated me was uh, I, I encountered about seven years ago uh, a, a paper by Norden Huang, who is an engineer interested in signal analysis, who used to work for NASA, who retired from NASA, is now working in, in Taiwan. He's a, a distinguished engineer. He's a member of the National Academy of Engineering. And, uh, and he wanted to do this. He wanted to extract components like that and extract uh, spectral properties that would change in time and, and so on. And so he proposed a method that worked very well for certain uh, uh, signals. And I always feel and I tell my students that if they encounter something that works well, I mean, and they have to try it out, of course, not just take people's word for it. But if it works well, it works well for a reason. And if the reason is not obvious from what people who do it uh, say, then it's a, a, a challenge for the mathematician, the applied mathematician, to understand that reason. I mean, and that's actually how wavelets came about. Wavelets turn out to be a synthesis of ideas that are much older from pure math and from quantum mechanics and so on, but they became... Uh, uh, something interesting in signal analysis because an engineer who had not heard from any of these things tried some method and, and clunked it, uh, clunk, uh, clunk, in a clunky way put something together that really worked for his seismic signals. And people were kind of, and so on, but it worked. If it works, it works for a reason. And it turns out to be related to all the beautiful mathematics. Now, I haven't found the beautiful mathematics for this yet, but we, uh, let me show you what he did. And so he gets a signal, and he wants to decompose it. He says, well, let me find the minima and maxima. OK. And then let me link them together with smooth curves. So he would take cubic B splines to do this. Let me look at the average of those two curves, and let me subtract that from what I had before. So the black curve in this bottom figure now is the difference between the original curve and that blue average, and that's one component. I mean, and then you have the remainder, namely the blue thing, and you can do it again. The problem is that it doesn't always do exactly what you want because he wants only one maximum above and one minimum below, and it doesn't always do that. So then he says, I do it again. How many times? Well, he sifts. So he... <laughs> The problem is, so you decompose your signal, and indeed, for this signal, you get that. And I said, but come on, Norton, 
I mean, yes, I see these applications. I see you do very interesting things for nonlinear waves. You find these, these oscillations and so on. I said, but this can't be robust against noise. I mean, all these maxima and minima. And indeed, it isn't. If you take the signal here on the right and you add a little bit of high frequency noise here and you do your decomposition, then you get these red curves, which look very different. Now, that they look different, okay, I've added a little something. The bad thing is that I've had a high frequency thing and it changes my low frequency modes. So it's very unstable. He had a, a, a student who made a, uh, uh, who, who made it much more stable, but what he does, I mean, it's even wilder, he adds to the signal something, a large white noise, uh, in many different realizations of the white noise. So he takes a signal, he adds noise, he analyzes. He takes a signal again, he adds another realization of noise, he analyzes and so on. And then he took averages of all these analyses. And that becomes very stable. But, and, and yes, it worked. Yes, it gave interesting results in situations where no other method that I know works, that I knew worked. And uh, he said, help me analyze this mathematically. I said, Norton, there's no way I can analyze this mathematically. I mean, you do something that's completely unstable, this, this maxima and minima. So, so what I did is, and we developed together with uh, uh, Jan Feng Lu, who is uh, now an assistant professor at uh, Duke and who works on material science, and with Hao Cheng Wu, who was then my student, we worked a completely different uh, uh, time frequency analysis that has still features that are inspired by Norden Huang, but something that we can analyze. And that's what I want to tell you about. So let me show you a little bit several, what several different methods can do. I mean, I've told you about wavelets and how wonderful they are. Well, why wouldn't they work on this? So let me take you this, give you this toy model. This is a toy model that consists of the sum of two different things. One thing that has a constant frequency with a trend, and the other that has a high frequency becomes less uh, uh, frequent and then high again. This is what's called a chirp. It does I mean, something like that. Uh, so if you want to talk about frequency, this has a frequency that's constant. These trends don't matter. Uh, and this has a frequency that comes down. And both of them only live on part of the full uh, interval. And it's very important that we can deal with that. So we always build our simulations like that. I mean, signals that appear out of nowhere or that die, we have to be able to deal with those. OK. So uh, if you take linear representations, so um, the windowed Fourier transform. So what the windowed Fourier transform tries to do is it says, OK, things are not constant. Well, let's take them by little bits. In tiny little bits, the frequencies will be more or less constant. Constant, I mean, and so on. So let's write things with a window. Let's write a Fourier, and let's take, find what the weights are that we have to build there. And let's make a depiction of what those weights look like. And this is what you find if you take a window that's nicely localized in, in, in frequency. But you see here, this sudden transition gives this big zone where things are all spread out. And you kind of see where, where things more or less are, but it's not a sharp picture by a long chalk. This is what happens if you try to be pinned better in, with a more narrow window, but you're much less precise in time. This is the windowed Fourier transform. Wavelets. In the wavelet transform, you make your building blocks with different scales, that's what we saw also in the images, and you put them at different times as well. And actually, I see that I forgot here an S not to the J, I'm sorry. Um, this is what I get with a very narrow, a very precise wavelet, but you see in frequency, it's very spread out. And it follows this behavior, but it's nowhere as sharp as that. I can also use another wavelet, that is much sharper in frequency, but you see here in time how much I'm spread out there. So none of these give very precise, and this is for a non-noisy, very simple signal. So a noisy signal is all over the map. 
There are time frequency representations for those of you who've ever seen those that are called Wigner-Wilk representations that are very, very interesting objects. But again, for something like this, they are quadratic, so they give lots of interference terms. So all this stuff here and here is all because of interference built in by the tool. It's not in the signal. Or other versions of it. Okay. So let's see, let's look at the wavelet transform and see whether we can understand what's going on. A wavelet transform, you take your original signal and then you look, you, you, you take your wavelet at different scales. A indicates scale, B indicates translation. So at different positions in time and different scales, you look at how much the signal looks like your wavelet. That's what I'm computing here. And you can compute it via the Fourier transform. You can, if you have this, reconstruct your signal from all this information. In fact, there exist many reconstruction formulas. One that's very nice is that you just, if you fix the time instant and you look at all the wavelet coefficients through scale, by giving them the appropriate scale dependent weight and integrating, you get your signal again. So, very nice. So this is true for the wavelet transforms that I showed you. But it's kind of all messed up. If I had something that was like A cosine omega t, and I did the wavelet transform on it, then because that is a, just one frequency, the transform gives me just the Fourier transform of psi in A omega, the scale is here, and I have this oscillation and so on. So I can, if I look at this, for instance, here I have two signals. Uh, here their envelopes and their instantaneous frequencies are determined by a smooth random process. But so I'm showing you here the instantaneous frequencies for both of them. Um, this is what the signal looks like. And if you look at the windowed Fourier, uh, the wavelet transform of the signal that you just saw, with uh, a wavelet that is reasonable in width and reasonably well concentrated in the frequency, this is what the absolute value looks like of the wavelet transform. Here I have superposed these instantaneous frequencies. You see, it follows that, but you see other things. First of all, it's become very much wider, so you don't have precisely the instantaneous frequency. Plus, the times where things started and finished are discontinuities in the derivative, and so you immediately see an enormous thing. So the picture is not sharp. But look at this again. It's because psi hat has a certain width that there are a whole lot of different a's that are going to give me a contribution, even though omega is one value. But if I look at, the, at how this thing oscillates in b, they all oscillate, regardless of the value of a, with the same frequency omega. And if we look back at the transforms, you can see that here. You see here, this whole thing had a constant frequency. Over the whole width, the oscillations have, are these vertical bars. Here, the frequency changes. Well, here the vertical bars are parallel at the dip and wider space than they are here. So you can read off over the whole width, actually, what frequency they really belong to. And so, here again. So that's what we, we then do. We say, look, if you took this and you differentiated it with respect to B, and you then divided by, by this in order to get everything uh, away, you would get the exact frequency. So for harmonic signal, this operation gives you the exact frequency. Now, of course, in general, you don't have a harmonic signal, but you are looking at things that you hope will be a superposition of few terms each of which is more or less harmonic. Um, just a little thing. I mean, if I'm going to do this differentiation, you might, you, would, you might well say, and you would be entirely right, that when I have noise, this type of thing is going to be very unstable. But so that's why I won't ever do a differentiation. What happens is that if you look at this formula, differentiating with respect to B is the same as taking the same expectation, uh, the same formula here up to a factor A with a psi prime there. So I'll just do a transform with respect to a different wavelet in order to get that. So I can compute this stably. Now, 
so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the wavelet transform and I'm going to take for each A and B, I'm going to compute what the oscillations in frequency in B tell me is the frequency the thing belongs to, and I'm going to put them together. And there will be places where I, 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 where, where I can't compute this instantaneous frequency very well because I can't divide by something that's very small, but if it's very small, I don't care. It won't contribute. So I only do this where the transform tells me their stuff, and then, uh, okay, so I do all that. Now, what I have done is I, I used to have this reconstruction formula. And what I have done is I've regrouped things that belong to the same omega together. And that means that if I sum over all the omegas, I get my reconstruction again. So time to see what this gives. So on the example that we saw earlier, this is what this transform gives. Now, uh, I, I originally, a long time ago, had, had, had done this for uh, uh, an, an audio application where we were, we, we had this idea of squeezing in a time frequency plane synchronously in time, and so we dubbed it synchro squeezing. I've regretted this name a lot since then because it doesn't sound very serious, but uh, we're stuck with it now. Um, so you can then extract the instantaneous frequency from there, and you can extract components if you want. Uh, I'll come there, I'll come back to that. So let me see, here I have a linear chirp. This is in scale and time what the uh, wave of transform would look like. This is completely noiseless, so this is very nice. And indeed, when you extract the instantaneous frequency, you find this. And, uh, well, this is the curve that we extracted. Here, I have something with uh, about uh, uh, 20 dB noise and a signal-to-noise ratio, and you see I'm a little bit noisier, but I can still extract my instantaneous frequency. This is uh, about uh, minus 10 dB noise, so it's signal-to-noise ratio very bad, and you see, I still can... Uh, I have all this crud here in this picture, and I have some crud here. I'll come back to that, because... I can reconstruct. Here I have actually two things that have frequency crossing. So you see something that is a constant frequency, something that is a chirp. Uh, what I can do is I can look at the synchro squeeze transform, and then I can say, let me take things that correspond only to this zone here and reconstruct. And what I show here is actually not the, uh, uh, the, the, the cutting of this. I, what I do is I cut out of this, I reconstruct, I get this, and if I then take the synchro squeezing of that, I get this. I can also cut in this region and I will get this signal, which has this instantaneous frequency with this method. And you see I'm not doing very well where the signals cross. But, well, where the signals cross, it's not very well defined. I could design methods that are better for that, but I wanted to show you what this method does in raw. And here I, again, have something like a, a signal-to-noise ratio about 20 dB, and it's still very robust. So you could indeed... So the algorithm works with continuous wave transform. You synchro-squeeze, you determine the instantaneous frequency, you extract the mode function and you repeat with the remainder. And that's what we do, for instance, for uh, the, uh, the, the ventilator weaning. Now, it turns out that the result is not very dependent on the wavelet that you use. The wavelet transform itself is. You've seen examples. You saw two different wavelets. They look very different. When you do this, it looks less dependent on that. So why would that be? Well, it turns out you can prove that if you were to try to find a function on time frequency domain that would have oscillations in time that have frequency omega at omega b, and I have to put extra regularization terms that I didn't say here, that I didn't put here. So I do want to have that when I add everything in, in, in omega, I get my signal again. 
I do want to have that things are sparse in frequency, so I have to impose that with an L1 bound, and I want to also have smoothness in B. If I do all that, then it turns out that what I constructed, in case the signal was of the type that I showed you, and we can quantify that with all the epsilons and deltas that you want, uh, will indeed be close to minimizing this function. And that explains why the wavelet doesn't matter so much. Because this function doesn't depend on the wavelet. And for different wavelets, you lie at a different distance from the minimizer of this, but you always lie close. Okay, now, we, this is now very recent work. You can find the result about which the next two, a few slides are going to be on the archive, where we posted it a couple of months ago. Um, Hao Chang was still not happy with it for the noisy signals in biomedical, uh, 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 even though it worked for the ventilator warning, work, uh, a ventilator weaning. Uh, there are many other applications for which we needed a little bit better precision. So let me come back again to these two signals I showed you earlier. Uh, actually, on, in the paper on the archive, we also show the code that we use in order to make a whole family of random signals that have properties like this. So that's another thing. We have an engine now to which, with which people can test. Uh, the sum of these two signals is this. And if I do the synchro squeeze, this is what I get. If my signal, however, is noisy, I see, I, th I, I forgot to put the noisy signal in. So if I add about uh, uh, zero dB noise to this, which makes the signal quite a bit more uh, agitated. So zero dB means that the amplitude with the noise is about double of what you see here. And so it's much less obvious what happens then. Then this is what you get. I mean, I'm not using uh, color. A color display is something which, which you can really cheat a lot if people show you false color. I mean, so I'm showing it you very honestly here in gray. You clearly see that the original curve is, is, is recognized, but you see all this crud here too. And uh, it's kind of hard to imagine, for instance, that there, I mean, how would you know that this is not signal, but this is, I mean. Uh, so we've done two improvements. First of all, I told you that in principle, things should not depend much on the wavelet. It turns out that this crud that we get there comes from the noise. You see, we make a very redundant transform of white noise, which means that we build in, the white noise is not correlated, but through our tool, which is very correlated, we build in correlation that we then detect. So that correlation is different depending on what wavelet you use. So if you take the average, you use many different wavelets, then, and you take the average, you already get a much clearer picture. However, you say, well, why don't I take 100 wavelets? Well, you want them to also be well localized in time and localized in frequency. And it's a fact of life that you can't do a zillion of those within those constraints. In fact, if I tell you this much in time and this much in frequency, that product determines how many independent wavelets I can find to do this. So you do the average over that many wavelets, and this is what you find. But then we realized, and this is something that is uh, uh, being found in a lot of recent algorithms, algorithms that have been found in the last 10, 15 years. There's a very nonlinear step in what we do. When we find this instantaneous frequency and we remap to that instantaneous frequency, that's very, very nonlinear. So even though in order to get this picture, I only could use four different wavelets because I didn't have room for more. I can, within that four-dimensional space, which gives me four different views, I can take other linear combinations. Yes, they're not independent, but because I'm doing something nonlinear, what I get from the nonlinear operation is not the linear combination of the, of the other ones. And so I can, not only can I do that, but I can, in fact, I can control that stochastic process, that random process, and I can 
compute what is the gain that I would obtain. And we can actually show and prove what the gain is. And this is what we get if we take such a nonlinear, an average over 20 different combinations. We can show that much more will not give us more better. You see, this is a much more, I mean, here is the superposition with the instantaneous frequency. We're bang on. And, uh, and if we did it on the non-noisy signal, then, uh, which is, we also see that all this interference that we get here has disappeared. And so we feel now, we're very, very happy with this new development because we feel we now have a tool with which we can really attack uh, many of the problems that not only in biomedical things, but other biological problems that uh, uh, we'd like to do. For instance, and this, is, this will be the last application I mentioned, uh, we are going to work with uh, biologists who are experts on bird vocalizations. Biologists have found, I mean, so first of all, they can they have now sensors with which they can record anything they like. So they have terabytes of data. So again, automatis automatization will be important. But the, the reason why they're so interested is that they have, I mean, people who, st who study bird uh, vocalizations have found that birdsong is something that small birds learn from their parents. And it, there are geographic variations in it. There are fashions in it. It changes over time. And you say, well, that's cool. But uh, it's interesting to see how these things propagate. It's also, and what I find actually even more interesting, is that they have started to realize that different species listen in on each other. Actually, they listen to what other species of birds say. I mean, they, and they can distinguish even between individuals and other species. And they can distinguish between what it is other species are calling because there's danger or because uh, they, they are looking for a mate. I mean, and so, so there's a whole lot more going on in, in communication uh, in, 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 in the animal kingdom than, than, than people realize. Now, in order to understand, so they have behavioral data. They can see, oops, and so on. And for the moment, what they do is they listen to these calls, and they write down and their syllables, and they, they try to imitate them. And they do spectrograms, which is like, like uh, earlier things that I showed you with the windowed Fourier transform. And they try to distinguish them and parse them and by hand and draw these curves on them and so on. And when I showed uh, uh, the biologist who was telling me about this, what we can do with this tool, she said, oh, wow, this is fantastic. I mean, uh, this means that we could just find those syllables and quantify the difference between the syllables, that we can trace in the signal the differences between different birds calling or different species. We can trace back, quantify what they react to. So that is something. So we're now finally in the stage where we have enough sensitivity to do this on these audio signals. And uh, I'm very excited. So, <clears throat> thank you very much. Are there questions? So, I had some of questions. Yes, in oh, I'm sorry. So the question is, sometimes you have uh, signals that uh, have uh, different bands, and uh, the dominance between the bands could fluctuate, could not always be the same. And you can also have events in that, that, that uh, humans can recognize, but that you don't trace very well in the spectrogram. Is that the? OK, so the spectrogram is something that you get with the windowed Fourier transform. And when you have shape functions that are not just pure cosines, 
the spectrogram will do is it will give you a kind of decomposition Fourier component. So you will typically see a shape, a, a, a behavior and frequency that, that's modeled over several different bands. And in, in voice, for instance, you get this. We try to address that by identifying the shape function. So instead of getting five or six of these bands, you get one shape function and its behavior. If you have a shift in dominance of these bands, what that means is that the shape itself is changing. So we try to find the shape, in change, uh, the, the shape change. We can only do that if the, if the shape change is soft enough it's so, uh, and so on. It's also very interesting for electrocardiograms because there, if there's, I mean, certain, there are typically sudden changes, but we want to pinpoint those again automatically. Um, so we address that by looking at changes in shape and, 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 and sandwiching together things that really were only pulled apart in the tool because of the tool we used, namely the spectrogram, while they really are the same instantaneous frequency behavior. So yes, we can uh, trace some of these things. I don't think that we will be able to do all of them, but we... Uh... There's another question. Can we use, in addition, filters, some type of filtering? Okay, so the question is, together with what we're doing here, could we use some filtering? Yes, we certainly could, if, if there are filters that you'd like to do. Uh, we will have to think again about what we mean by filtering. And, and, and uh, I mean, uh, we probably want to do it in a time-varying way. Already, when I was extracting components, and I could do it here too, I haven't shown you the thing, but once I have it nicely localized, like this, I could define a filter that goes in this region in the time frequency domain, put every else to zero, and since I have a reconstruction formula, I can, so it would be a nonlinear filtering. Other questions? There. Well, <laughs> that, uh, I mean, you see, we still have stuff here. We would have to threshold. Once you threshold, then we can do that counting. I am not sure that we always want to do that. In fact, if you want to do that, then we need to do curve linking. And uh, curve chaining is something that can be very tricky when, you, when things are not perfect. So uh, actually, like the idea of using the noisy picture itself to do the reconstruction. I mean, to define masks coarsely rather than the exact curve, to define zones, that will be easy. And then not even trying to do the curve, just say we're going to reconstruct with those weights, and that will be good enough to get a very good reconstruction. So that's what we're exploring now. Thank you. Another question? So I wonder that <coughs> it can happen that you can easy have ECGs of somebody who has essentially a heart attack, but yes. the, the doctor doesn't see it. He just looks at it and says, it's not, I don't see anything. Uh, you... Yeah, well, I don't know. I mean, uh, that's, that's uh, if, I'm so sorry, I don't have Hao Chang in my pocket here because he would be able to answer. But uh, I mean, because he's a medical doctor and a uh, signal analyst specialists, radiologists, but uh, um, we do want, one of the things that we do want to get out is indeed anomalies in heartbeats. I mean, uh, uh, we, uh, so one thing that we already are doing is uh, getting out what's called the so-called uh, J-wave. So, which as far as I understand is something that has no real exact definition in terms of electrocardiogram. It is something that can cause for uh, sudden death in young, healthy people. Mm. And so uh, in the US now, anybody who is participating in a team sport in school has to be examined by a cardiologist who has to check 
that they don't have this J-wave. So it's the kind of thing, it's like pornography. They know it when they see it. But uh, they, they, they don't really, uh, did you know this quote? This was a Supreme Court sure. justice who was being asked to define pornography. He says, I can't define it, he says, but I know it when I see it. Uh, so they, they recognize, they, they know it when they see it, but they didn't have a precise definition. And so based on, on our analysis, we, we have now produced the first quantitative marker and so this has been published, but I mean, so we can do things, but uh, we're not where we want to be yet. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, yes. In neurobiology, one has lots of signals now of the brain, local cue potentials when you have cold shakes. So, uh, yes. And one would like to understand the underlying dynamics. Yes. Okay, so in, in, in EEGs are uh, actually have been more resistant to signal analysis than ECGs have. We uh, are finding some results by doing several layers of this. So we extract uh, uh, amplitudes and instantaneous frequencies and then in those we again look at decomposing further. And then you start seeing things. But it's only the first time that we're starting to see some of these patterns and we don't know yet about. We haven't correlated this yet to, with, with behavior or, or with, with anomalies. Or, or, uh, so, uh, but I do believe that this kind of analysis or better versions of it, and I also have, just like with the, 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 thing, the, the stuff that I talked about on Tuesday, where we now feel that we finally have the right mathematical framework with our fiber bundles, I do believe there's something like that here too, but I haven't found yet what it is. I mean, so we're still groping. But I do believe that that kind of mathematical understanding is essential in order to get this these, these information out, because you can't get it out with simple linear methods. There's a question over there. Yes. Spe speak up loud or no, take a, there's a microphone. You have to press on the button. Yeah. Um, yeah. Regarding the, the last slide, I was wondering when you talked about combining the different representations from different wavelengths, if you would implement the learning research, and regarding the other question, the other one was the uh, basis, Well, we, since we use a continuous wavelet, we, we don't need to work uh, with the basis. We just use, uh, so what we did in order to do work here is this was done with uh, so-called Morse wavelets, which give you very good for, uh, localization in time frequency domain. And we looked at the size of the region that we could afford, which is basically determined by the, 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 the spacing of these components. And we looked at, we tried to put in as many as that as possible. And then we looked at linear combinations and an average of all the nonlinear results coming from those linear combinations. I believe, and this is something, but this is something that we haven't tried out yet. I believe that we will get even better results if, so you would first do a first uh, go over the signal, which tells you where things are concentrated in time frequency plane. And then what we could do is we could look at things that are over this larger region where we could afford better, uh, more uh, uh, wavelets and, and so on. And we could actually follow things. I mean, so the important thing is that, that the time frequency region over which you concentrate does not, not, never contain two of the components. So you have to, but we could, we could what we could do is we could uh, uh, first coarsely uh, split and then find a region and we could even adapt the number of, of things we take uh, depending on how far the other components are. Um, now, I, I believe we can do that. I, we haven't done it yet, uh, but that's my understanding of why these things work. And uh, we could also easily automate that because as I said, we will be easily able to detect where things are and then we can look at where the, the distances, and then we can adapt to, to that. So I think that will give even better results. Here it's. 
microphone. Yeah. Okay, so uh, yeah, certainly you can. I mean, uh, my email is ingrid at math.duke.edu. Uh, um, but but uh, the paper is also on the archive. And if you contact uh, Hao Cheng Wu, who is one of the authors, then uh, I'm, I'm sure he will be happy to share the code. Okay. Any other questions? Here, in the middle. <coughs> Oh, uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, I, I, I doubt that very much. Uh, um, we, we would want to follow, so individual, uh, well, we would want to follow instantaneous frequencies and the behavior as that in, in, with the goal of, 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 uh, of, uh, of helping doctors making diagnosis for patients or, or, pa or, or people to, to check for themselves what's happening. But uh, I, have, I haven't thought of it at all within the context of privacy. Or, or, I mean, uh, so I don't know. Yeah, I didn't mean exactly for privacy, but I was curious. If people uh, have some unique proficiency and if it's that it's just possible mathematically to uh -huh. um, represent the switch. So unique frequency, I think in a heartbeat, I don't know. I, 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 I have no idea whether we all have our own little heartbeat idiosyncrasies. Uh, 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 I mean, it would be intri intriguing if that were the case, but I don't know. I mean, I really don't know. OK, so I think uh, <coughs> it is already relatively late. So I think this was a unique series of Pauli lectures where especially the question showed that they expect you to solve half of humanity's <laughs> problems. It's rather <laughs> remarkable that when you, 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 you sort of uh, mm -hmm. nurture that hope. Um, uh, I don't think many mathematicians are able to do that. Uh, I think in the name of Eteha and everybody here, we thank you very, very much for uh, these lectures. It was really great. And I... <laughs>